we're undergoing the like global transformation of, uh, of our ecosystem and landscape, which is horrifying. And now when you're mentioning the, um, you know, being there, uh, what also happened um, is prior to, a couple of days prior to Nagba on May 15th, uh, there were the, the first burst of global protest in solidarity with Palestine. Uh, so we happened to, you know, go uh, to uh, join protests in San Francisco and um, also to, you know, have that kind of momentum happening um, was really powerful and um, very, I mean, the whole process is um, like invigorating um, mm -hmm. and, um, and and it's definitely kind of a trust hold in terms of the narratives that we are just talking about in terms of occupation, in terms of protection of land and air, water, privatization of um, basic um, resources to survive. Mm, biology. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, um, and the transformation of landscape, I think it, uh, what we're talking about now is, um, was interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's awful, but, you know, it's like fascinating to what extent the technology and um, um, kind of like um, corporate logic and settler colonial logic is going when it comes to um, what is happening in West Bank and specifically in Gaza, that like forensic architecture, um, they've been doing a study about the, this form of um, um, kind of change of, kind of earthquakes and airquakes and how actually um, the, the, the weaponry and the like military technology goes in the direction of actually like directly transforming the landscape. So the destruction is not immediate, but it actually kind of, it's a seed of destruction that manifests later where, you know, the building doesn't collapse immediately because of the bombing, but the soil is being um, transformed to that extent that it will collapse later. And it would be just like, oh, it's an old building and it just collapsed versus no, this is um, systemic destruction of the property and the transformation of the land. So, um, yeah, um, there are like talking about landscape and the way we, um, and the, the kind of like systemic ways it's being transformed or mm -hmm. being preserved on the other way, on the other side uh, is really um, relevant. So you're now back in New York, but you came from the town where you're from, you spent a few months there before you came back to New York and then went to um, to uh, West Coast. And when you start to draw those parallels with the mentality of Serbian public discourse or awareness of these forces that I think in the West are, to us might be visible because I think the in some sense the public discourse has in some way involved to make us aware of, you know, questions of uh, race inequality and climate change and similar kind of questions. But I think in, a, in an environment where you spent, how, how long were you in Serbia for? Oh, you mean this last time? Um, yeah, yeah, just now. I've been there for almost six months. Six months. How does it make you feel, the kind of, being there and observing the the level at which people engage with these big questions that perhaps are not um, addressed or spoken about well um yeah i mean it's, um so for to address the, the beginning of the question um i don't um well in a lack of a better word believe in mentality um but um, the um, kind of system of you know social, political, um, ideological constructs to which people are placed in a certain position um, to um, you know experience themselves, see themselves, and act act upon that act upon those in order to feel um, in whatever way empowered. So um, the question of identity is a um, global question. I mean, it exists in every, every single comp, uh, context. 
um, and it's being um, both unpacked um, in, um, in positive kind of like radical way in terms of um, you know, intersectional thinking and, and doing, um, and also um, kind of like decolonial understanding of one's own um, self. Um, but also um, on the other side, as you know, we've um, heavily experienced like is being manipulated with in order to um, get to the point of disruption and the point of conflict uh, that would further uh, exploitation and violation of human rights. So to, um, I don't know, it's a, uh, so while I was in Serbia, um, it was also for me, like I've been, we come from the same, uh, you know, hometown. I'm from, uh, we're from Ožice. Um, it's a small city um, in Western Serbia, close to, very close to Bosnian border. And um, it's a complex place in itself in terms of its history and um, kind of like layers of um, like identification with that history and this continuity of it. But it's a working class city. Uh, I come from, um, you know, working class family of, you know, farmers and, and factory workers. Um, and um, I went, to, I left uh, Serbia to um, educate myself, but also to actually, first and foremost, after studying there and actually being employed in um, teaching um, in high school, high school and elementary school in Ožice, I needed um, distance from that context in order to um, and distance from uh, oppressive environment, like that in not in a sense that, um, um, you know, I, yeah, I just like needed the, the distance from that context to understand who, um, who I am, what my voice is, um, to actually, uh, you know, displace myself from kind of claustrophobia, claustrophobia and oppression of kind of like generated you know, values and beliefs that were just like piling upon each other. And, um, you know, like normalization, normalization of violence of sorts and normalization of silencing when it comes to, um, you know, like, um, you know, collapse of institutions and collapse of, um, you know, socialist values um, that just went into some completely different direction with um, when kind of like neoliberal powers started transforming the landscape. And um, um, yeah, so we've, it's, you know, going back is always, um, I mean, first of all, the, mm, I don't know, I mean, I would like to hear also how you um, feel about, you know, diasporic, uh, you know, self or the concept of diaspora, because mm. it's still what bothers me, for example, in Serbia, that there is still this like um, notion of, oh, the people in Serbia and people who left and people who come back. And it's always this like concept of some kind of return as, um, you know, that people kind of stuck with like religiously, you know, like, oh, who is going back? Like, who is returning like why person returned and so on where the the the, um, the truth of uh people who either you know accepted or or embraced or or haven't like that post-yugoslav identities um which were also pre-yugoslav identities um have um you know are all over the are all over the world so the the borders of serbia or any of of the countries that have um, kind of like increased migration in the past like 30 years um, are mm, undefined. Mm. So when that question of like, what is community? Like who is, who identifies as being Serbian or not uh, is more complicated than that. And um, it's really, um, what is- Well, uh, I think- I think it's Mm -hmm. But I think the question maybe, or, or the way to look at that issue, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating thing to think about, is really uh, profoundly in, in the question of how do you feel when you go back? You know, uh, yeah. well, you know what, are, what are the new anxieties? What are the new uh, conflicts? 
that you feel, you know, conflicts that you, or anxieties that you wouldn't have felt had you not had the, not just the distance, but also really a kind of life and an experience, a more elaborate, long duration experience of another cultural socioeconomic environment. Um, well, mm, so for example, um, for me, it's um, even when I think of my experience prior to, to you know, moving to United States, like I felt um, um, in, um, I don't know, I said this like multiple times, but like my first lesson in school got coming to, you know, first grade in elementary school was like class discrimination. So, um, so practically like what I'm experiencing once I go to Serbia, I see the, um, the ongoing normalization and amplified normalization of violence of like dehumanization of working class of, um, to uh, unbelievably palpable silence on all the kind of like disastrous processes that are happening within our kind of like societal framework. And, um, you know, and all of that was whoever um, actually experienced injustice or came from the position of actually having like radars and responses to injustice knew that this is going to happen. This is not, um, but apparently um, there were also people who lived in some kind of fairy tale and uh, there who are like being surprised by these processes. And um, when I, um, you know, when I go, uh, I mean, and also like I'm, you know, collaborating with people in Serbia, I work there once I'm there, you know, I have friends and family and so on. And, uh, um, you know, I, you know, how I feel, I feel pissed, you know, like I, I go there and I feel, um angry um like what happened to people what happened to us what happened to the land what happened to this country what happened to you know workers um who have built the um our future mm -hmm. um and um what happened with all the like invisible silent you know people who facilitated for us and our generations to actually have some have life and have future and infrastructure and um to what extent they're dehumanized so yeah, I feel um, I feel angry. Uh, I feel uh, angry that um, you know um, the the uh, amazing landscape um, and amazing like social lives that existed in the countryside, like outside of the cities, um, is completely obliterated. Um, and I feel inspired and um, in love, you know, with people who are actually providing some other exa example and and um, providing some form of resistance to this um, destruction and uh, organized crime and uh, uh, intimidation that the current government is absolutely, um, you know, is, is you know, committing pretty like genocide and ecocide over the people who uh, live and work um, in Serbia. So to say, you know, like how I feel, you know, I feel happy to see my family and, you know, uh, some of them, um, like people important to me have died um, in, um, in the meanwhile, um, I'm happy that, you know, I still have like elderly that, you know, I can, you know, talk with and share uh, experiences mm -hmm. and hear, you know, their opinions, um, because it's really questionable to what extent that um, in a lack of like ancestral like knowledge and value and uh, in a sense institutional memory of like one's own lineage uh, is going to be preserved because we've been silenced for such a long time. Like, especially, you know, even today, like um, tokenism as talking about, you know, equality and, um, you know, um, social and racial justice and so on is still very present. I mean, even, you know, to the extent where, um, you know, it's like if someone comes, you know, if someone is, you know, from the countryside and uh, is doing, uh, you know, um, active in like arts or in any kind of, um, you know, social sciences or whatever, like it becomes like becomes tokenized. And and um, the, I'm thinking like 
how is that even like how did we get to the point where in the country where 80 percent of people actually come from working class come from you know the country um we don't have representatives of working class in places of power within leftist organizations like and i'm talking about you know uh, the um it's really i don't know what wor worries me a lot is the the speed in which the the kind of um you know both um like right-wing and neoliberal fascism um, that, and the entanglement of, of, um, of the two um, in the region and like what is actually being normalized through the process of actually fighting autocracy um, and offered as, a, as some kind of healthy um, solution. And um, yeah, I think that um, on the other side, it's, uh, it's, um, but do you really think the, the question there in that, in that cultural socio-political environment really is the, the left or right question, um, or is there, is there something far more systemically to do with the culture of, um, just not being able to sustain democracy, functioning democracy. Well, um, the um, I seen the core of well, if we think of like material reality and um, extensive impoverishment and systemic impoverishment and enslavement of um, working class and. Um, um, you know, poor um, and uh, marginalized and vulnerable, uh, that is um, absolutely accelerated. And um, in the upcoming years, decades, um, it's not going to get better. Like, yes, there are there is some um, change in terms of organizational strategies and how, you know, people come together. And uh, to go back to your question, like, yes, there is a question of trauma on like non-addressed trauma. There is a question of trust or like mistrust that is, that is inherent to uh, both, um, um, you know, both as a consequence of different uh, traumatic experience, but also as a um, kind of dominantly generated um, state of being. Um, that was instrumentalized by e different governments and their media apparatus. So um, in order to actually uh, think of democracy and uh, think of a collectivity and um, uh, coexistence of different forms of collectivity, we really need to um, you know, fight fear, fight silence, uh, fight um, the um, you know, like self-loading, the like inferiority complex, um, shaming culture and so on, and all these like destructive mechanisms that uh, people have been, um, you know, pushed into and transformed by in the seven, past several decades. Um, and that is, you know, that is collective work. It's not, you know, the, it's not about, like, uh, you know, a single person going out there and getting an award. It's just like, no, we need to work together. Like we actually, you know, it's, I was thinking about it the other days, uh, like, you know, outside, just the context of, you know, toxic environment, like toxicity, any form of toxicity, abuse, and so on, um, you know, having like abusive work environment, like regardless where you're working, and most of the people with the difference of like what is happening during the pandemic with this kind of like, you know, individual experience, like you find yourself in a, in a group dynamic where you need to navigate certain kind of energies. And if you do experience uh, discrimination, um, abuse of any kind, like it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, like um, racial, economic, um, just the toxic power, power dynamics. Um, it is very difficult from that experience to again enter some collective, um, collective work, but also to cultivate trust towards collective uh, imaginary. So what I'm seeing, uh, not seeing, but like experiencing uh, is um, talking with, you know, just like really range of people um, and to, you know, the question of like left and right, like that was 
Um, I think that's also like another tool to further divide people and uh, unable uh, to actually come to some point of like collective, um, you know, understanding. And by collective, I don't mean like, oh, we all come together and like kumbaya style, but uh, to actually have systemic, um, you know, educational processes, like radical approaches in terms of, you know, lifting, lifting up people's, um, you know, dignity, hope, uh, action, um, and um, the major issue is, and that's not just in Serbia, that's uh, all over the place, is that um, the, we are, we normalize dehumanization, we normalize uh, violence towards nature, towards landscape, between each other, um, informational violence, you know, the frustration is being channeled, but the otherness is um, absolutely um, encoded in um, in everyday interaction where, um, you know, instead of, um, you know, actually like practicing listening, which I also think it's an issue within our culture where, um, you know, patriarchy has shaped the conversational discourse. Um, the practice of care, and by care, I mean to actually collectivity, listening, leaning onto each other and actually cultivating mm -hmm. that radical movement is feminist. And, um, and in internationalist context, it absolutely has to be inter uh, intersectional. Um, so if the, if the conversation is being still shaped by um, patriarchal um, notion of integrity, which is like to dominate and uh, we'll and, we and to win and to be right, you know, mm. and to not be mistaken. Um, yeah, we are not gonna get far, but my uh, belief is and my hope, and that's what I'm, you know, dedicating like my, my life to, uh, is to change that in whatever capacity possible. Um, because I, um, you know, it's really, uh, it's a question of like, who are we inspired by and how we find ourselves inspiring. And if we come from the place of hurt and the place of, um, you know, self um, denial in a sense, due to all these different mechanisms we are talking about, it is very, it's, that's the process in itself. And um, um, yeah, I'm, it's, but it, uh, it's a collective work. It's not. Um, but when you say it's your, it's your life's um, goal, or I know it's, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite a big war. It's quite a big statement. Uh, being able to say that um, you're dedicating your life to a certain kind of fight, really though maybe it's not a, a fight where you would say I am right, but it's a kind of process of healing, etc. So, so what, what are those, I mean, I, I was going to kind of go step by step towards asking you this question, but I might just skip a few steps and just ask, what are those tools that you have and, and how do you use them? Um, well, I mean, the, the question is also in terms of tool, you know, having or not having tools. Um, I, uh, you know, the, the, pro the trans transformation of any kind is a process. It's not, um, it's not something that, um, you know, it's kind of like goal oriented where you, you know, set up the goal for yourself and then you uh, have a reason to hate yourself for not achieving it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, something that is it's kind of like ongoing work of both um, at least, uh, you know, that's how I've experienced it as, you know, um, finding ways to, as an individual, but also as a part of community, um, think of, um, think of ways how, and like radical transformations, like how, you know, if we are talking about, um, uh, injustice and, um, how we can collectively imagine, um, just, uh, equitable, world, then we need to first ask, not act from the point of like self-righteousness and 
but to actually ask ourselves, okay, so how these corrective like policing, um, you know, abusive and so whatnot, like, you know, oppressive methods uh, function within us, like how have they shaped us, what we were uh, able or unable to, uh, to see or uh, the conclusions that we are, you know, landing into. And uh, that is a lifelong process. And especially when it comes to, you know, since, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an artist and um, I've been, um, you know, because of the place where, you know, I'm coming from and my, um, uh, background, I had a lot of difficulties negotiating entering these elitist spaces um, with um, uh, obvious like injustice uh, and discrepancy between the reality of everyday life of people who are actually sustaining this capitalist system and the culture that is being produced within these spaces. And there was a question, like obvious question, who is this for? Like what, um, where as artists am I actually participating and do I even want to participate in it? And that perspective absolutely radicalized moving to New York and, um, and, um, and actually became a way to, um, and just you not know, just moving to New York, but actually, you know, like working here and in different capacities uh, within, the, within the art industry. But practically in the past almost 10 years, I've been actively um, you know, thinking, making, uh, curating, producing, um, you know, community building, um, and um, um, that in, in which really um, a lot of these pathways and a lot of these um, kind of um, are really rooted in um, female friendships. Um, in understanding of how those were affected. Like, for example, when I was living in Serbia, like I left when I was 26, actually on my birthday. And um, how, you know, it, 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 took me, it took me a moment to actually start unraveling certain dynamics and beliefs with which um, I transitioned here that informed my way of thinking of myself as a, as a woman, as an artist, as a community member, sister, uh, you know, f girlfriend. The, and then the work actually at some point intensified and became more intentional. And that's how Heckler um, actually came to be. And- um, So what is Heckler? Heckler is, um, is an, Mm, it's going through the uh, like, you know, the, the mission is going through transformation now. It's like being updated, but it's an um, artist-run platform uh, that um, you know celebrates and examines the relationship between hospitality and conflict uh, through merging of artistic, pedagogical, and organizing strategies, and uh, it's um, mm, collective in a sense but I uh, would call us more of a, both as a collective or community um, that is a kind of expansive um, group of people from uh, different contexts, like political, personal, social. And um, yeah, so Heckler started as a correspondence between Jovana, my best friend uh, from Ožice, um, who lives in Belgrade, is a writer, and, um, you know, kind of like our shared struggles in terms of like finding one's own voice space to express it, finding courage to write um, and to be like, to be kind of like openly opinionated. Um, so it really started as a, just like a small Facebook page uh, for us to actually um, uh, sustain that friendship where we would, you know, discuss different topics that are mostly, you know, they were, you know, feminist topics and had like a small group of people who would engage with uh, with that but after like you know like life happened uh, in uh, in the meanwhile but what then um how heckler transformed was actually the the uh, format kind of that exists now it's like in 2018 we actually um after having different conversations with our community 
mostly New York, um, Heckler took the, the, the format of the actual uh, platform um, that is very much rooted in international solidarity, um, community care and building, intersecting of different um, struggles and um, experiences coming from a range of political contexts and actually creating and holding space for um, these to be shared, but also to cultivate radical imaginaries. And what is was also a relevant aspect of Hekler, and that this is being this was done in in different formats. In like pre-pandemic, we would, you know, organize um, discussions, gatherings, uh, exhibitions, uh, publication, make publications, um, also, um, you know, make objects. Um, but it was very very much merging. Uh, it was like a lot of uh, kind of like actual hospitality, like food, you know, events um, that were also used as a vessel to, for some form of um, like direct or indirect political education. Um, so uh, yeah, and then once pandemic started, as you know, everyone, uh, we went online and uh, last year uh, we realized the assembly that lasted several months and that was very much um, kind of like community generated around the topics of public space and collect collectivity, futurisms, also how fear um, transforms into commons with um, kind of anti-fear series, which is really um, relevant to uh, actually start developing. And um, so it, in this phase now, we are, we've been a group of really amazing um, you know, people um, and uh, well, we've been, we are working on the new assembly for this year that will also take place online on Zoom um, that um, kind of looks into um, different forms of infrastructures, um, kind of communal infrastructure, political ones, also the ways of, um, ways of organizing and how we think of movements and how we think of um, what, you know, different social contracts, also solidarities, and um, um, how to actually, from that like individual position, bring um, ideas, emotions, and experience into collective space um, as an organizing principle. So um, hopefully that, you know, and the idea is to open platform to, with, um, in like solidarity with this like the decolonial um, struggle um, that is happening globally and to have conversations with people who, you know, first and foremost, like need platform to share um, what is happening within this context and like what kind of, you know, discourse um, support and um, kind of intertwining and weaving of perspectives need to happen in order to come up with um, you know, um, sustainable um, collective work. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. So there, there's two aspects that um, I think um, are quite interesting. And, and you know, they're both um, in the kind of formation of Heckler and, it, and its kind of form. I think first, if you could just briefly reflect on that idea of bringing hospitality and conflict into relationship. Where did that come from? Or how, how are those two things? How is con connecting or examining conflict against hospitality or hospitality against conflicts uh, a way to generate a discourse? Um, well, I wouldn't say that um, it's one against another. Like I think that we are, and we've been, um, living in the reality where these are symbiotic uh, for quite quite some time and it's a it's a wide umbrella um, kind of like dynamics umbrella that um, can you know op that opens conversations in so many different uh, like interdisciplinary um, you know um, branches um, but Hospitality and conflict came as a, as a focus uh, for multiple things of uh, how, you know, first of all, the, uh, the concept of guest, um, when do we feel as guests and when do we feel as 
uh, as hosts and is it possible to you know feel as both um you know, being in the united states that has um uh, definitely you know question like what like what does it mean for united states to be this like ultimate host um for so many people globally uh on the stolen land on occupied territory and how do we as um migrants or immigrants into this context um you know what kind of social contract what kind of codes of behavior appreciation and acknowledgement nurture when we come to uh the places that uh don't necessarily um you know come from our lineage of um of commitment labor ancestry and so on and this is not just the united states this you know the, this is the question for um pretty much most of the world um, that has been occupied, colonized, transformed by different forms of like forces and migrations and so on. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other one is uh, um, also related to what can refer to uh, kind of our experience of hospitality uh, in, um, in um, you know, Balkans, where uh, it's something that is like highly revered, celebrated, um, we are amazing hosts and so on, but also we facilitated and hosted um, the um, so many transform like social trans and political transformations and and it has been a place of consistent conflict with actually really small historic breaks that were peaceful. Um, so to um, what does it mean to host this agreement is um, one. Um, what is it, you know, it's like the, the concept of gossip or, or like a feminine, you know, female um, and of, of survival is just like hosting also the heckler or hecklerke, which uh, has a, um, is, it's, it's a gendered term in, um, in Serbian, uh, Serbocration, that um, um, kind of like the celebration of people of, and in this case, predominantly like coming together and plotting against repressive regimes. Um, and how that has been done is actually through mostly orally, uh, where one would come to, you know, whoever is a, um, you know, this well, the, within the concept of safe space, um, you come to actually share an information, share who did what, like what, what one needs um, is either an individual in the community or a family or you know, community itself. And uh, a lot of these conversations are, um, you know, kind of underground. They are, um, uh, and interestingly, uh, the conversations that don't, a lot of times are not uh, of interest of men. Um, they would, you know, it's, but it's also intimidating to, and men, I'm not, just to make it clear, I'm not like <laughs> uh, classifying here to be like a, you know, but um, I mean, when in terms of the like, what is the where the, the like authority comes from uh, within the context uh, and within patriarchal society, a lot of times that authority comes from men, or it's being kind of embodied or performed or so on. Um, so the the concept of gathering um, and being together and working together, um, weaving different perspectives, experiences, and so on. Um, is something that is in the core of it. Um, and um, from the perspective of, um, you know, these kind of like economies or ecologies of care that are not capitalist, that actually are older uh, than this, um, you know, system that we unfortunately co-created um, is something that, globally, uh, at least when it comes to some kind of like radical movement, people are, um, you know, going towards like celebrating um, indigenous or just like BIPOC um, ancestry, um, radical thinking, socialist um, theory, um, as well as um, just like non theorizing, non, you know, like not using the kind of like academic logic. And that's what we are talking about a lot within our, you know, conversations that we've been having is just like how to, you know, develop um, collaborative and co collective methodologies where 
this um, rational uh, academ academic logic is not prioritized. Um, and um, I think from the context from which we are coming from, where at some point um, looking into um, anti-fascist uh, heritage, looking into social and cultural um, organizing in like post-war, World War II, um, since like, you no, know, since practically like 41, where um, the idea of commons um, was as the most radical um, um, in our context, but also in, um, I think, yeah. uh, within modern, you know, within 20th century in European context. Um, uh, yeah. Can we just for, for briefly stay on, on a point that I thought was quite <laughs> okay, interesting? I go, I go on tangent. But um, no, which I think is great. Um, <laughs> but that point about which I think maybe as you were speaking, I then maybe made the connection to the notion of hospitality. And that is the point that you raise about occupied territories. Right. And how do we deal with that kind of post colonial, uh, well, all of our post colonial conditions, right? In some sense, many territories have been occupied, if not all, in some way or another. And I'm trying to understand, you know, how, how does this not drift into something that is quite unworkable? in terms of, you know, who was here first, who is here now. And I don't know, and I think this is maybe the point where actually uh, some of the some of the notions that Heckler is exploring maybe connect to that post-colonial conversation. Well, I think that the conversation, it's actually, um, when we are talking like this, uh, it, um, I mean, one, one aspect of it is just like, yes, it does in these like big words, um, you know, anti-imperialism, anti-occupation, ending, you know, um, abolition and so on. The reason why these ideas are radical because um, the people who actually fight for the like life centering um, you know, future that is, uh, you know, shedding the, the skin of the old system where we are globally recognizing that this is unsustainable that we are going towards self-destruction and that sounds like a big idea okay like great like how are we going to get there um is actually um through continuous effort like through like uncoding and like decoding oneself um from um you know and not just like individually but definitely collectively and collective education collective organizing uh you know um transforming that fear into something that um, the fear of speaking up, the fear of being present, uh, fear of make, saying no. Um, and I have to mention here, there's like really uh, an, an example. It's maybe it's a small example, but it's very significant, significant uh, and something that, you know, has you know, inspired me and that I've like that resonated with me uh, strongly in the past period is actually decolonize this place. And um, the action of Decolonize This Place, which is a collective based in, um, in New York with a focus on, um, um, you know, um, taking back the land, uh, ending occupation, um, fighting um, um, anti-Black -black racism, uh, also um, with, um, you know, centering, um, you know, indigenous um, knowledge and, and strategies and so on. Are they, um, they've been uh, in the example of Strike Mama, for example. So to, to just like to use an example that um, speaks directly to this, like what are the methods? What are the strategies? Where is this going? Like, yeah, we can theorize, we can talk about it, la la la. Um, but when we think of extractivism, so it's not a matter of like, oh, who is on the land now? The thing is just like, how is land being used? Who claims the land? Who generates um, um, ownership, privatization, and occupation through like neoliberal uh, corporate system? So um, on the um, 
board of MoMA as uh, one of the most celebrated uh, museums and generators of cultural image and cultural agendas um, are the people who are producing weapons, who are producing munition, who are um, profiting off of national debts uh, across the globe, who are killing only water sources within the countries that we cannot hear about because that's never going to you know, reach uh, mainstream media unless people on the ground organize and we internationally organize to distribute that information. So we have this like cycle where people who have been benefited from destruction, from human violation, human rights violation, from uh, absolute like uh, destruction of the landscape to the point where it's no longer livable, um, who uh, laundry their money through art and cultural institutions, as well as dictating what does it mean to be an artist, which an artist also means like there is no free society without a free artist. So if uh, our artists, uh, we as artists are subjugated to this idea that the only thing that we can do in the society is to have our practices and then be you know, embraced by curators, embraced by institutional hierarchies in order to tell our truths, that is a very limited and very dangerous place that we are in. And that is the reality for a lot of people who actually identify themselves with this kind of concept of contemporary artist or whatever. So um, th that is an example of just like, what does it mean to like shut down MoMA? So they've been organizing these different, um, you know, like workshops and uh, just like gatherings in front of the MoMA in the past like several weeks. And I was um, like happy uh, to, for the first time go in person, uh, actually, I think like last week. And uh, yeah, you, on, on, from that one perspective, you have a small group of people who, ho who show up and block MoMA for three hours and um, educate, use that as an educational platform to talk about the money, to talk about like where, you know, follow the money, uh, who are the members, why are they, you know, um, using museums as their soft power through which then they um, dictate what is culture, you know, what is contemporary, what is modern. Um, and they base, um, uh, and this is not just MoMA, this is any museum in any uh, metropolis that, um, you know, accumulated wealth on like looting um, objects from colonized objects and labor from colonized territories. So it's not like to, to go back to the question, um, so when we all get educated uh, within our field, which is you know, arts, culture, like architecture, you know, whatever, we're cultural workers or cultural producers or however one, you know, identifies, um, that is like our agency. It's the same, it's a similar thing with, uh, you know, Palestine, that's another thing. It's just like how many institutions that have been, you know, centering social justice, um, migrants uh, rights, refugee rights, and so on, um, you know, having these uh, uh, BLM solidarity, um, you know, messages all over the place have, have like uh, came out uh, in solidarity with Palestine. It's you know, it's a really, this is a really big moment. And that's why it is really important for all of us in whatever capacity to actually support it because it's an accountability. It's a kind of more palpable, globally visible moment of like asking for, uh, demanding accountability because um, um, the toxic philanthropy that is facilitating um, the dehumanization, cultural erasure, and um, exploitation and um, like extractivism um, is absolutely uh, being you know washed uh, like literally like when it comes to capital, but also when it comes to moral perception of the people who are practically murderers. And um, yeah, I think that it's our responsibility as people who are you know. Um, um, you know, thinking, working through these ideas, um, benefiting from the system in whatever, you know, level to actually come together or to work in any capacity um, in some somewhat organized way um, 
to actually normalize this attitude of what uh, people in decolonized this place call refusal, um, which I think is, is really, really powerful. When you look at Palestine and the perseverance of Palestinians to um, demand you know, to live, to embody dignity and courageousness and to resist for such a long time, uh, where the finally, you know, thanks to Palestinian diaspora and uh, the kind of the wave, like post, you know, on the wave of also BLM global protests, like there is definitely, you know, global awareness and global energy and strength that is actually, you know, coming together in some major collective way. Um, I mean, what is happening in Colombia, um, you know, yeah, I, you know, maybe in our context, that's not happening. Like it's not, you know, uh, it's not, um, there were attempts, but in some like non-defined um, way because of um, still for me, confusing uh, reality of having such a small territory and a small group of people who are to that extent divided um, that, you know, even having that class divide that, you know, if you are, um, and forgetting with whom you, you are sharing the, um, you know, on whose like back you are actually living, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just. And uh, there, there you're talking about Serbia. Yeah, I'm talking, uh, yeah, I'm talking about Serbia. Just like, you know, being, you know, seeing so many of, um, and also like going back to diaspora, part of the conversation where where there isn't where there is um uh better understanding um mm -hmm. i think what, what i'm trying to say sorry if i'm like rambling the well there is something with something about that um uh, stepping away and that distance that allows you to see something right uh, yeah that allow yeah but what's uh What's complicated within our context is that um, the, the what would be you know, considered like post Yugoslav uh, diaspora or diasporic community, it's not, uh, and any diaspora is not this like homogeneous, uh, you know, kind of entity. Um, there are so many fractions within, you know, like different forms of, uh, you know, identification or uh, lack of. Um, but, um, you know, what I'm seeing, um, and like working with people who come from different, um, contexts and, um, uh, how those diasporic communities actually function, like also like with, you know, challenges of unions and, uh, um, but also like how, you know, people, how people congregate, how they actually enter collective work and so on. Um, it's that's something that is definitely lacking um and uh there are you know wherever you have a context where so many people are dispossessed dislocated um either pushed into exile or like self-imposed exile because of the economic um and um you know difficulties um and corruption uh discrimination of any sorts um there is a way to to actually congregate there is a, so when these moments happen um there is a response you know so when something is happening in serbia it's not just a matter of like oh people who live within the borders of serbia to you know identify with that problem like we are all identifying with that problem um and uh, um the aspect of what i think is you know uh, with or actually like works uh, against the um, um, like our diasporic unity is actually this um, um, shaming culture that um, um, by the virtue of people not you know like how how those like post Yugoslav identities are being um, embodied how they are being understood as political positions. And how do they relate to, um, you know, both us as citizens elsewhere, but also um, citizens of um, of Serbia? Those countries. Complicated. Those countries, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, um, we, for example, um, when um, 
in July last year, um, the, you know, protests when there was a police brutality um, towards protesters in Belgrade, there was there was a diasporic response, and we also organized here. Um, but it's really like, uh, you know, I think it's also a matter of, um, you know, learning how to organize, learning how to mobilize, and how not to segregate. Um, and I think that that's uh, in general. And but also, but also maybe learning how to care, like on yeah, a basic you, level. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, to care and listen. I mean, a that's certain responsibility to towards. Uh, when you asked me, like uh, you know, at the beginning, how I you know felt or how I feel, um, the app, like the level of apathy, um, in and I spent most of the time in Ojitsa um, when I was there, um, and also like organizing or you know with uh, this kind of diaspora group to um, support these kind of anti-extractivist. Um, um, like ecological movement that yeah. is, you know, like developing um, with specific, you know, if it focus on um, on like Rio Tinto and like just the, the filthy, also like filthy industries and the, the what you know people yeah. struggling with yeah. to protect the land. So, I mean, it's that's the like when we talk about you know um, colonization, like that's the, the we are living in this kind of like neo-colonial reality where. Um, you know, if we like from having like public land to having nothing to having the situation where government can just come at your door and take everything that you've ever, you know, established like generations back. Um, that's a severe shift and um, you know, that has to alert everyone. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of like normalizing it by like, oh, yeah, you can get some money, you can get a buck and then just go elsewhere but um you know the it's like absolute the government in serbia is absolutely uncontrolled um they're doing whatever the fuck they want uh people cannot sustain their living anymore like the when it comes to everything that used to be public or somewhat public um you know in terms of utilities in terms of like roof over one's head in terms of you know public transportation water air um everything is just not is, is being capitalized on and uh, in the worst scenarios like privatized and just like um, the the apathy towards really horrid um, palpable you know situations uh, is really for me was terrifying it was just like how is it possible that in one um, town that you know, has maybe like up to 70,000 people. No one reacts to the fact that the uh, city mayor, mayor, right, the natural link, um, that a city mayor um, enabled citizens to um, implement gas in order for people to breathe in the city. The air in Ujice was purple during, during winter. It's just like, it was impossible to breathe. It was impossible to walk. You know, during COVID, uh, people would actually get you know sick because of air pollution, and not because of COVID. And this is also like the industrialized town, which uh, imagine if the industry was actually um, you know working, operating. Yeah, exactly. So you have a situation where it's proven that the city mayor, instead of taking this like very reasonable price from the uh, you know, public call like Serbia gas, Serbia gas, uh, to actually facilitate gasification. Uh, so people are not using, you know, shitty coal. They're not, you know, the fires, fire, stuff like that. but also that the, the factories are, you know, operating differently, not on uh, this kind of like toxic, low quality fuel. Um, instead of doing that, he, uh, with a local, you know, uh, develop, you know, real estate developer or whatever, um, creates a deal that instead of being, for example, 20,000 euros to, to pay, boost it up on like 70, 70, 100, no, 700,000 euros. And then does the favor to the city to put it down to 300,000. Um, 
So besides doing that and like stealing money from all the citizens, plus not, you know, sabotaging a gasification process, they also build illegal structures like with, without building permits that are um, measuring temperature, measuring gas and so on. What happened and the reason like I'm just like providing the context. And so what happened while I was there is that, you know, two, like one apartment exploded like in my street um, where my parents live. Um, it exploded by like woman coming into the apartment, calling them for a month saying, I can sense gas, I can smell gas, can someone come in, check in? And they were like, oh, just like open the windows, you know, someone will show up. So the woman comes from work, turns on the light and everything just goes to shit. Like the full on apartment just explodes. Um, do you think anyone responded to that? Like she lost like 60 or 70% of her skin, you know? And um, nothing. So if, um, you know, when I'm talking with my friends who have families, they have like little kids, you know, who live there. And I just like, like, we need to, like, let's talk, let's organize, let's, you know, make some noise or whatever. They're just like, well, you know, it was always polluted. Like, why now, you know? And there's this like, um, it's just like, like, you know, dude, you have a kid, like your kid is like three years old. Like, do you, you know, what do you mean it was always polluted, but it doesn't have to be polluted. There are like there are like specific steps that can be taken for the city to be like functional place. Do you see do you see that an artist um, is taking a role of an activist more and more, or that that is a more appropriate domain for an artist? Um, well, I mean, it's also you know how people define activism. Um, The, um, because because I have a feeling that your art practice has become the activism in some way. We can define activism, but it's become these things that you passionately care about and these things that you passionately want to not necessarily change, but that you want to influence. Um, well, I think that you know the conversation needs to start. You know when that question is asked is what are um, our, um, you know, cultural institutions, like what are those authorities and hierarchies that actually shaped our understanding of what does it mean to be an artist? And, um, or what does it mean to be an activist? Uh, or what does it mean to care or engage or uh, escape? Um, and like all these, um, you know, ways of being in you know, what does it mean to produce? And does one, um, you know, even identify with a, with a concept of artistic production? Because, um, yeah, so I guess the, the big, you know, a lot of work needs to be uh, placed. And there are so many amazing people who are actually doing that um, in terms of not just institutional critique, but and in like some aspect that's also what you know we are concerned with is just like how, how um these um you know op oppressive exploitative and misleading manipulative um institutional structures uh, that we've normalized and that shaped us uh, are now being transformed like what does it mean to ask for institutional accountability what does it mean to imagine to like radically imagine what institution is? Do we need an institution? You know, do we need a museum? Um, and um, so, to be an artist, you know, that's the that's actually because I mean that would be a question for each artist. Like for me personally, it's just like my education in arts. Like, do we, does one need to be educated in arts? Like, do you need to you know have someone who is like in this like institutional structure? That in most cases absolutely dysfunctional and you know like led by people who don't have integrity to talk about freedom in the first place like not to mention um you know <laughs> to shape one's mind when it comes to like finding your voice and uh, um you know using it powerfully um and transformatively like towards you know collective um so 
Yeah, I mean, that's the first question. It's just like when, if one considers oneself an artist, like then the question is like, what, what shaped your understanding of yourself as an artist? And um, is that limited field? You know, am I like from like nine to five an artist and then I leave, you know, the studio or conversation or, you know, whatever the, what the thing is and then I become something else. Um, so, you're implying that an artist is uh, established against the institutional frameworks that exist around this. Well, if we think of art as an ultimate communicative tool, the tool that um, is there to interconnect, um, to um, build uh, um, muscles for you know empathy, um, to um radicalize in that sense where you know we see each other in each other and um and not flatten our experience but actually embrace our differences uh, and understand where these experiences are coming from and then based on that act to constructively change um the infrastructure um that we are just that is enforced onto us um then yeah, I guess your the, the response to your question, like, yes, artist is an activist. But then the question is like, oh, can there be an art? Like, it, it always goes into this direction, like, well, can you be an artist and like not deal with political? Can you, you know, sit and contemplate and do things and make objects that are completely devoid from any kind of socio-political, like, kind of whatever? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's you, you can, but then, um, you know, the ones, once engagement uh, doesn't come, uh, doesn't have to come from artistic position. Like it doesn't come through, doesn't have to come through art. For some, you know, you have, um, and so I'm like discovering also, you know, for myself that maybe I do need now in order to be more focused and more committed within the, um, you know, the range of, um, you know, things we talked about maybe I need to actually protect some of that space to do that like completely, um, you know, um, not necessarily escapist, but I mean, like not charge, not like, not like logically and, um, you know, like conceptually charged work um, as a way to sustain myself and as a form of self care. Um, but then if we're talking about artistic practices that talk politics and talk um, you know, like social engagement and serve as um, indicators of certain like societal syndrome or whatever, and exist in the white cube. And the purpose of that art is to circulate within the art market um, and to gain capitalist recognition, either commercial or critical, um, then we are talking about hypocrisy. Because, um, you know, my parents, your parents, they're not going to go into a gallery to, uh, or a museum potentially, my definitely, um, to learn what is happening right now and what we need to, they're feeling it on their own back. They, they know what is injustice. So this like segregation where art is, became this kind of like elitist, um, elitist um, structure, like a facilitator practically of both facilitator and a commodity uh, to perpetuate elitism and to actually per perpetuate a false idea that art needs to be segregated um, in order to exist and in order to fully you know, develop itself and um, to get to the, some form of completion and understanding is absolutely- so that You also need faculties uh, to be able to um, absorb it, right? Yeah. And that, um, you know, that outside gaze of um, how one, um, you know, is being contemporary, you know, the, the concept of modernity as well. And that's like a really great, um, you know, the, the talking about modernity um, as an imperialist crime that is also by this group. Um, but also how, you know, I'm, when I go back to my education, like, um, in education in arts, um, which was more education in, um, you know, discrimination, elitism, and um, then, then arts, uh, which I'm like grateful for. 
it definitely like set up the foundation for uh you know the current work <laughs> but um you know i went to like art academy in novi sad and um and both both uh, me and my sister so that was like eight years of our uh um collective time <laughs> within that institution um and now asking about like oh, what is the role of an artist and actually thinking of all the people who are supposed to be authorities who are like self-proclaimed you know authorities or mentors or so on and um lack of um um dignity uh lack of truth telling um and lack of courage to actually face themselves in their positions that were absolutely subjugated to western art production just like you couldn't um you know and the how this uh, the the fabrication of socially engaged positions that actually don't engage society um and this is not something that and also like nepotism where you know, in in Serbia, but also in Balkans, like talking with you know, in like post Yugoslav context, like talking with different people who, um, you know, um, gained their uh, education in uh, Zagreb or Ljubljana, Banja Luka, Sarajevo, and so on. Um, in you know, in Serbia as well, Montenegro. It's just like it's the same pattern. Like you have this like nepotistic uh, structure uh, where you know you have uh, mediocre artists who. Um, you know, propagate, they're protecting their positions of power by disempowering everyone around them yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, fabricating the idea of culture that absolutely has a, like nothing to do with freedom and with cultural preservation and the, the sustainability of, you know, different identities, voices, struggles, and so on within those institutions. So when we ask like, oh, what is the role of an artist? I'm just like, what is the role of these fucking institutions? Because artists don't have problems like artists can artists are like being an artist and choosing to actually be brave and being you know like dealing with your shit dealing with your traumas working like laboriously and rigorously to um you know create certain form of messaging uh that is supposed to resonate that is supposed to echo start conversations start waves of of change um is already integral aspect of being that like you, you know and then what the, what we learn in institutions is actually is not to be that like you know um i have to you know say i was thinking about it yesterday and like thinking about this conversation um how for me experience coming to the academy of Novi Sad um and seeing the how little those people work and um the minimum minimal level of commitment that they had towards their jobs, towards their students, uh, towards the institution, and towards the society, and towards the you know uh, immense amount of labor that working class in Serbia has to um, you know do and sacrifice their like livelihoods, family relationships, health. So someone can like show up and take that like fucking salary for doing nothing. For me, that's crime. Like full on, it's criminal. It's just, um, and that's just one, you know, and that was like obvious to me. And with such a set, like sense of entitlement um, that like unquestionable, unquestionable entitlement. And for me, there is no difference between that unquestionable entitlement and the unquestionable entitlement of people who are committing systemic violence um, in government, um, in uh, military, in uh, neoliberal cultural sector, like it's a you know. Do we do we need institutions though, or do we just need do we need different institutions, uh, or do we not need institutions at all? Um, do we need institutions? Um, well, we need, um, you know, the institutions as um, both physical, um, as, a, as a physical infrastructure, but also as, you know, um, kind of like systemic infrastructure are there. Like it's something, it's now at this point, that's a resource. Um, it's, uh, what has to happen is like to actually 
um, reimagine them. You know, okay. What, so what 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 would be that role? Is it a meeting point? Is it a is it a form of authority? Is it uh, what is it? Um, well, I mean, the first the centering care. You know, not centering. Um, um, you know, fascist bureaucracy uh, and not centering um, the concept of success of an individual, um, where you know, if you are vulnerable and if you're marginalized, if you are needy, um, that you're being discarded. You know, if you cannot take care of yourself, you're discarded. We are living the absolute like um, dispos disposability of human life. Like the COVID um, absolutely proved that. that. And especially like the, this um, kind of accelerated death that doesn't leave any room uh, to mourn, to process loss, both as individuals or as, a, as communities, as collectives. It's just, it's working towards um, further normalization of that. And um, I think that's something to, and when I'm speaking, like there is always this like moment where, you know, I'm talking about, with, you know, about these things that I both um, generate sense of urgency, but also the, I'm emphasizing like it's really important for us to take care of ourselves and take care of others. Um, because this is a, a, something that, you know, we really need to work on. It's not either or. The system is broken. It, it can't function like this. Mm. If we continue maintaining um, institutions as they are, um, concepts of governing, um, of control, of policing, and so on, um, we are fucked. I mean, we're fucked already, but you know, we are just like shrinking the um, that gap, that portal that Rando Tiroy was talking about, just so accurate and beautiful that we are going through the portal. Like we really have agency to um, choose what direction we are taking, what we are taking with us. And I really wish us to choose not to take this like violent, um, discriminatory, racist, uh, disposable, you know, um, exploitative shit with us. And it's like patriarchal, you know, like white supremacist domination. Um, and I want to believe that um, we can do something together. And that, that's- And, it, and, it, and, and it feels like, and it feels like maybe to conclude because I, I, I don't want you to, <laughs> At the end of this, be completely exhausted and dead. <laughs> you probably will be, but, um, but um, and then it looks like art perhaps is a form of healing process, meditation, in 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 a similar way that um, you know cooking would be um, <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon or something. You know. Um, well, I mean that's a. Um... It's an kind of interesting question because there is also um, um, danger of equating art with therapy, um, which mm. is not the case unless that is um, integrative process within ther therapeutic process. Uh, but art, you know, be making art and making you know mess message making um, and um, uh, also depends on like you know as a language and as an organizing uh, strategy, um, as a mobilizing strategy, um, community building and so on, like depending how one actually thinks of um, art as a, as a system or um, um, either both, you know, embodied, but also, um, you know, how, how, you know, it manifests through these different strategies that um, I, do believe in transform transformative power of art um, as a um, both catalyst, as a facility, like as as um, facilitating tools, as a, a communicative tool, um, and um, artists as uh, you know people who do practice people who do practice art uh, being. Um, educated 
in it or not being well versed in or like what would be like affluent within the capitalist um you know art production of uh talking about you know like professional development navigating artistic production navigating you know the kind of like social capital necessary to you know exist and sustain within it that once we get to the point of transformation where artists are no longer serving that system but actually redirecting those skills and knowledge and tools into movement building um that's when oh, i think we will see really um you know the very moving and radical and transformative power of art so the it's a complicated question because the, the point is not to enter into kind of individual reasoning uh how one um you know makes or like you know it it's like those are uh, those are individual kind of constellations of mm. uh, how one came to a certain place it's a one's path um that is not is like is non-linear but where we are now and what is the potential of um these decades um that we've lived and that we are about to you know enter um and these like very transformative collective um, kind of a global also experiences is to actually um, liberate oneself from from the system capitalist system that is imposed on us and that is shaping our understanding of self and our communities and and uh, limiting the um limiting our imaginaries and uh, that's why the um, concept of refusal is so powerful it's just like refusing for what are imaginaries well the um, you know the how we go beyond how we can um think of future as now um and radically imagine um you know equitable um you know equitable future where you know everyone wins you know like mm. you know in a lack of the you know better like where, where we are actually you know fully immersed in sustaining you know ecologies of care um sustaining this planet sustaining and, and like um celebrating resources that we have and just like as you know we talk collective, about and collective notions of collectivity exactly, like re removing ourselves from normalizing violence because we are like constantly normalizing violence like the, the, you know the, this whole system that we're living in is absolutely doing that but and it sounds as if we need like a kind of Buddhist transformation, a real transformation of consciousness. But that's, you, know, you don't have to be a Buddhist to know that like your uh, neighbor cannot afford breakfast. No, I know. You know what I mean? Like, or that, you know, someone cannot pay electricity bill or that someone is living underneath the bridge or, you know, on your stoops or somewhere. Like, so it's not, I mean, the whole, like, it's understanding also like material culture um, and not just, you know, I think that that's what that, uh, like mutual aid, for example, like that also like didn't show up overnight, but just the history, like the political education and the history of different forms of organizing that were, were always emphasizing the disenfranchised, like how, you know, how you get to that position, how you, um, how the violence is imposed onto you and then you are being blamed for perpetuating violence um so yeah, yeah i mean that's where um yeah i mean it's probably not going to happen um i don't know i want to believe that in our lifetime we are going to see those changes um but that's what i said it's a you know it's something to commit your life to with the understanding that you might not 